Today we continue the topic skeletal connective tissues and uh, in details we are going to talk about bone tissue. It is very complicated, so let's start from the most difficult aspect. This is the composition of the extracellular matrix. You have to remember that skeletal connective tissues are the part of connective tissues um, and connective tissues are characterized by the very well developed extracellular matrix and bones are not an exclusion instead here extracellular matrix is very important as it helps to perform the main function mechanical support extracellular matrix is extremely stiff and it helps bone to support our other organs to protect them and um, to provide a proper locomotion so why bones are so stiff because they contain not only organic components, as all connective tissues do, but also inorganic components. And inorganic minerals, they prevail. Up to 65% of all the extracellular material is represented by hydroxyapatite of calcium. So 65% of our bones are made up of calcium and phosphate salts. And that's why they are so stiff. But if uh, bones are made up of only inorganic components, um, they will be fragile and uh, it will be very easy to break them. That's why inside bones we also have lots of organic components. And first of all, these are collagen type 1 fibers. Please remember the type of collagen because it is important. Because type 1 collagen forms thick bundles like in a fiber cartilage you remember and it helps to endure high mechanical overloads and uh, collagen is uh, organized um, in a special way we'll talk and discuss a little bit later and except collagen there are many other components in the ground substance these are protoglycans and glycoproteins as in all connective tissues, proteoglycans are represented by glycosaminoglycans and core proteins, uh, nothing new. And as for the glycoproteins, you remember another name is multi-adhesive proteins, because they provide adhesion between different components of extracellular matrix and cells. Among others, you have to remember such glycoproteins as osteonectin, something like to connect yeah nectin means to connect osteonectin it connects calcium with collagen so it provides it it is like a glue helping to adhere minerals to the fibers and another glycoprotein osteopontin it helps to adhere cells to fibers and together they are used to, to integrate different components of the matrix one with another. Also, we should remember one bone-specific protein. It belongs to sialoproteins and it, is, it has the name osteocalcin. Calcin because it helps to accumulate calcium locally. It provides some local high calcium concentration. That's why it has the name osteocalcin. After that, growth factors also could be found, such as bone morphogenic protein, which helps to develop new bones, it helps to um, uh, differentiate uh, different uh, cells of um, bone lineage uh, from mesenchymal stem cells and also sclerostin could be found, it has an opposite function. So sclerostin and BMP, they balance each other and they regulate the process of bone regeneration, remodeling and many others. Please remember them because um, um, the a synthetic version of BMP is used now to treat bone problems um, after the bone fracture to stimulate the bone growth and so it is important to understand its function. Okay, in general nothing difficult but of course there are lots of components you have to remember. First of all inorganic components, then fibers, ground substance like proteoglycans, glycoproteins and bone specific protein with growth factors. Okay, let's move on. And uh, after we have discussed the matrix, we have to discuss cells. There are lots of cells in the bone tissue. And uh, first of all, I want to remind you that in the connective tissue, uh, there is the common precursor for many cells. And it is called mesenchymal stromal or mesenchymal stem cell. 
this cell could differentiate either into osteoblast or into chondroblast or fibroblast or adipocyte. So there is a common ancestor. And uh, bone cells, they also derive from the mesenchymal stromal cell, as well as chondrocytes, as well as fibroblast. Okay, so osteoprogenitor cell is the first cell decided to be a bone. So it has no any science in its structure, but genetically it has decided to become the part of bone lineage. Then osteoprogenitor cell differentiates into osteoblast. Osteoblast, this is very active cell, actively producing bone matrix and actively producing bone tissue. When osteoblast becomes mature, it is called osteocyte. It is much less active, it doesn't divide, but it is uh, present in the alive bone and um, along the life. And that's why our bones, they are alive and they can regenerate. After that, bone lining cells could be found either on the surface of the bone tissue in the periosteum or inside the bone marrow cavity in the endosteum. And bone lining cells, they are inactive, but under some circumstances, they might differentiate into osteoblast uh, and provide the regeneration of the bone tissue. So being derived from osteoblasts, they could differentiate back into osteoblasts. And after that, apart from those cells, um, we have to mention osteoclasts. Osteoclasts, they derive from quite another source, and their main function is the bone resorption. And it is important to take into account in details, we'll discuss them later. So now let's talk about every cell one by one. First, the most immature cells at the beginning of bone formation, we have osteoprogenitor cells. They derive from the mesenchymal stem or stromal cell, as I've already said. Why it is important to understand? Because these cells could be easily obtained from the abdominal fat and uh, under some circumstances, for example, along with the surgical intervention in plastic surgery, some abdominal fat is removed. So many people they want to get rid of um, the extra weight, so they remove the abdominal fat and those cells could be obtained out of there. And after that, these same cells could be transdifferentiated into bone cells or uh, cartilage cells, and it is very important. So mesenchymal stromal or stem cells are very promising source for the regenerative medicine. Please remember that. Then, uh, such cells, they differentiate into osteoprogenitor, and after that, osteoprogenitor differentiate into osteoblasts under the action of some factors. And among others, we advise you to remember the core binding factor alpha and a runt related transcription factor second. Of course, bone morphogenic proteins and uh, pulsed electromagnetic field. So, uh, it is very important that some patients, uh, they can't walk, they can't uh, perform physical exercises, so their bones uh, should be stimulated, should be trained, uh, and uh, electromagnetic, uh, pulsed electromagnetic field um, is the way how we can train even uh, the osteocytes in, in such patients. Okay, so we'll discuss electromagnetic field a little bit later. Then, they reside in the periosteum or endosteum. So, osteoprogenitor cells, um, they uh, remain on the surface of the bone or inside the bone marrow cavity. Then, uh, after that, we have to discuss osteoblasts. They are more differentiated cells and uh, these cells, they actively divide. Um, they have the ability to divide mitotically and they actively produce bone matrix. Bone matrix is called osteoid. Uh, what does it mean? Osteoid um, implies uh, only organic components. So first, osteoblasts, they produce organic components, and after that, this organic components um, undergoes the process of mineralization. So extracellular matrix without minerals is called osteoid. And osteoblasts, first, they produce osteoid, collagen, Protoglycans, glycoproteins. And after that, 
they stimulate, they launch the process of this matrix mineralization. And it is important to understand how they mineralize the extracellular matrix. In this process, the first step includes um, the secretion of so-called matrix vesicles. So from the surface of osteoblasts, some vesicles are pinched off and on the surface of vesicles there is an special enzyme called alkaline phosphatase. Alkaline phosphatase, it breaks down different molecules, some mobilizing phosphate groups out of there. So if this group is present in different molecules, then phosphatase cut it off and in this way increases locally the concentration of the phosphate groups. Then the next step is the production of the osteocalcin. Osteoblasts, they produce osteocalcin to the extracellular matrix and as we remember, it helps to increase local concentration of calcium. So, under these circumstances, around osteoblasts, we can see high phosphate and calcium concentration. They start to invade the matrix vesicles. They enter the matrix vesicles and start to produce the crystals of hydroxyapatite of calcium. And then, mm, those uh, vesicles, uh, they are used as the uh, start point for the formation of the hydroxyapatite crystals. Um, so every small vesicle is the small crystal. Then those crystals they fuse one with another and this wave of mineralization spread in the matrix um, and in this way the whole matrix get mineralized. Um, so please remember those three steps and those three factors very important. This is the presence of alkaline phosphatase to provide high phosphate concentration. This is the secretion of calcium to increase the concentration of calcium. And this is the presence of matrix vesicles um, because exactly inside those vesicles hydroxy, hydroxyapatite of calcium starts uh, to be formed. Yeah, it, it is formed uh, and uh, starting from those vesicles, crystals appear to grow and to fuse one with another. So in this way, osteoblasts, they first produce all the organic components we call osteoid. And after that, with the help of matrix vesicles, um, osteoblasts, they stimulate mineralization of this component. So osteoblasts are very active. They contain lots of uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi complex uh, and many other organelles, um, they can divide. After they've performed their function, they have different um, directions for further development. Uh, they either differentiate into mature osteocytes. For example, when osteoblast produces a lot of matrix around itself, it gets embedded inside the matrix. And being embedded, it feels lack of nutrients, so it shrinks, um, it decreases um, on 70% comparing with the osteoblast. And now we call this cell osteocyte. So osteocyte doesn't divide, um, it much less active metabolically because it is embedded in a very dense matrix. But only several percent of osteoblasts uh, transform into osteocytes. Some of osteoblasts, um, they, uh, li they, they remain on the surface of the bone or in the endosteal cavity. So they uh, transform either into periosteal or endosteal bone lining cells. Bone lining cells, uh, they are resting cells and under some circumstances they could transdifferentiate back into osteoblasts. So these are like reserve cells. Um, and uh, predominant amount of osteoblasts, they die by apoptosis. So to maintain the bone matrix, um, much less cells are needed than to produce it. So osteoblasts, they actively produce, and after that only a few of them are left in form of osteocytes inside the tissue to maintain it and to remodel it with the life, um, replacing old fibers with a new one, for example. 
Okay, then in this aspect, we have to say several words about bone lining cells and about endosteum and periosteum, especially periosteum. So, uh, by analogy with the uh, cartilages, on the surface of the bone, we have a special layer which is called periosteum. Periosteum it is represented by the dense connective tissue with blood vessels and nerves, so it provides nutrients, nutritional support, the first function. And the second function is regeneration or the growth in thickness. So, regeneration and growth due to the activity of bone lining cells, osteoblasts and osteoprogenitor cells. So in the deep layer of the periosteum, we can find uh, osteoprogenitor cells, osteoblasts and bone lining cells. The ratio depends on the age. Of course, in young individuals, osteoprogenitors could be found in high amount, while in elderly people, bone lining cells. But under some circumstances, for example, along with the bone regeneration, some cells, they could increase in number and they become active, so the ratio vary significantly, under, depending on the circumstances. Okay, so do not forget about the periosteum, because sometimes it is transplanted, and sometimes it is transplanted from the same patient from one bone to another to stimulate the process of regeneration, to improve the process of bone uh, remodeling after the fracture. And uh, in the same way, inside the bone marrow cavity, there is an endosteum. But endosteum, it doesn't have uh, so many blood vessels, and it has also bone lining cells and uh, osteoprogenitor cells, but in less amount. After that, so after we have discussed the um, bone progenitor cells, some um, osteoprogenitor cells, some um, osteoblasts, some um, now we talk about mature cells osteocytes and they are very specific cells as they are embedded in a very dense extracellular matrix. Um, here we have examples uh, from the scanning electron micrograph showing us that they reside in a cave-like space called lacuna, like in cartilages, and uh, they exhibit lots of, extra, uh, of uh, cytoplasmic processes. With the help of those processes they communicate with each other. And this is the only way, only one way, how to survive in the bone tissue. As the matrix is so stiff that it prevents diffusion. Diffusion is impaired, so cells, they share nutrients via those cytoplasmic bridges. They send uh, lots of arms, lots of processes towards each other. Those processes, they fuse and they exchange nutrients through the gap junctions, through the cytoplasmic interconnections, um, and in this way they are synchronized and uh, also they can get nutrients. Um, so let's uh, summarize this uh, information. They are located in the lacuna, they have uh, lots of uh, canaliculi. Uh, I mean, canaliculi, these are the tubes in which those processes are located. Um, and um, they are communicated with the gap junctions, uh, and of course they also expose hemichannels. Hemichannels, this is something like a half of a gap junction. If gap junctions um, are represented by two tubes, which are in contact one with another, and gap junctions are needed to communicate to neighboring cells, then hemichannels are needed to communicate the cytoplasm of one cell, with the extracellular matrix. So it helps to monitor the concentration of different components in the extracellular material and to respond some in different ways. After that, yeah, the average lifespan. They are not very active cells, but they live very long life, up to 20 years. And um, uh, after that they die and they stay in the same lacuna. And in young children, almost all osteocytes are alive, while um, in aged individuals after the 80, three out of four osteocytes are dead um, and they are embedded there forever. Then, the activity besides of osteocytes, um, it is regulated by different factors. And osteocytes, uh, what's the function besides why do we need alive cells inside our bone tissue? Because um, they need to remodel the 
extracellular matrix. They need to resorb old fibers and ground substance components and to produce new one. And this process should be balanced. But sometimes osteocytes, they resorb more than produce and it results in the fragile bone. Bones become fragile and bone fractures are frequently observed in such individuals. Sometimes instead osteocytes they produce more than resorb. And the question is what affects their activity? What factors do stimulate osteocytes either to resorb or to produce the bone matrix? And the answer is the mechanotransduction effect. Please remember, because it is very important in understanding how our bones work. Mechanotransduction is the mechanism when osteocytes, if they are overloaded, if they are compressed mechanically inside bones, for example, when we walk, our femoral bone is regularly compressed with each next step, yeah? And this regular compression results in the stimulation of osteocytes to produce more matrix, to make lacuna more stiff and hard, to protect osteocyte from being squeezed, what is it, compressed, yeah? And uh, instead, if uh, some individuals, they do not walk if they are not um, undergoing physical exercises. For example, if patient is immobilized, it can't move. Um, yeah. So osteocytes, they are relaxed, they are not compressed. And under these circumstances, if they are not compressed regularly, if they are not trained, they start to resorb lacuna to make lacuna more comfortable for their life. They start to increase the space around them. And that's what makes bones fragile. So bones, they respond to the mechanical overload. So when you undergo physical exercises, you train not only your muscles, yeah, but also your bones. And while muscles, they increase in the size, and you can see the effect, uh, uh, obviously, then bones, they become more hard and stiff. They become more mineralized and they can perform their function better. Uh, under these circumstances. Okay, let's talk now in molecular on the molecular level how this mechanotransduction is realized. Um, first of all, when mechanical forces are applied, um, you see that the fluid inside the lacuna it is communicated with the fluid um, around the bone, the extracellular fluid inside the bone marrow cavity, and regular compression of the bone during the physical exercises, results in the movement of this fluid. So when we walk, the fluid inside the system of canaliculi and lacuna starts to flow. This flow of the extracellular fluid results uh, in the transient electrical potential. And voltage-gated calcium channels get opened, calcium enters osteocytes uh, and it stimulates uh, osteocyte to exocytose some factors to the extracellular matrix um, and to produce more matrix as a result. Also on the surface of osteocytes um, there is a um, primary cilia primary cilium. You remember that uh, we have three types of cilia. Uh, methyl cilia, like in the respiratory tract. Then uh, we have a special cilia, nodal cilia, in the gastrulation process in the primitive node region. And also there is a primary cilia on, on the surface of almost every cell. And this cilia helps to detect the motion of the fluid on the surface. And um, now it is believed um, that exactly this primary cilium, primary cilium helps to detect the motion of fluid and it helps to realize the mechanotransduction mechanism. So as a result, um, factors produced by osteocytes, they could also stimulate osteoprogenitor cells uh, or bone lining cells to transform into osteoblasts and to produce more matrix um, in a positional way. So when osteocytes are compressed, motion of the fluid on their surface stimulates uh, uh, them to produce more matrix and to stimulate other cells 
to produce more matrix. In this way, bones, they become more hard and stiff. Uh, and this is important to take into account when we are talking about immobilized patients or, for example, astronauts. Um, you know that um, when they are in the space station, they are not affected by the gravity. So they need to undergo special physical exercises to train not only their muscles, but bones as well. And when they return back to the Earth, they should be protected for a while from different physical exercises because um, their bones are very fragile, their muscles are very, very weak, and um, bones also are affected by the absence of gravitation. So it is important to understand. Then, after we have discussed in details how osteoblasts produce bone matrix, how osteocytes um, uh, regulate this bone matrix and maintain its um, stable composition along the life. Um, we have to talk about an opposite process, how bone matrix um, is degraded and why do we need cells resorbing our bone. First of all, I want to say that first of all, bones, um, these are the sources of calcium. So if we need calcium for the bloodstream, we resorb it from our bones. Um, so this is the first function of those bone resorbing cells to mobilize some calcium out of the skeleton. The second function is bone remodeling. So in bone formation, there is the consequence, uh, there are some stages uh, when primary bone tissue is replaced with the secondary. And to replace immature bone tissue with a mature one, to improve the structure of the bone tissue, we need to resorb some bone matrix. For this purpose, we need osteoclasts. So the calcium mobilization and bone remodeling, these are the two main functions of these cells. What's unusual with them? First of all, the source of their development. They are not local, they are not residents of the bone tissue. Okay? They derive from the bloodstream and they derive exactly from the granulocyte macrophage progenitor cells. Moreover, they are multinucleated. And it's obvious because they need to resorb very hard and stiff extracellular matrix. Um, and to do that, the activity of only one macrophage is not enough. So many, many cells should be fused to exocytose, to expel many lysosomal enzymes out of them, to the extracellular space and only in this way they can work, only in this way they can dis resorb the bone tissue. After that, uh, what you have to remember, this is the marker enzyme, tartrate resistant acid phosphatase. Why it is important to remember? Because it could be measured uh, in practical medicine and in this way uh, we can uh, analyze the activity of um, the bone resorption process. So if this enzyme is elevated, we think that bone resorption is too active. And if this enzyme is inhibited, is low, the activity is very low, then bone resorption is inhibited like that. Uh, do not please um, confuse acid phosphatase with the alkaline phosphatase because alkaline is characterized for osteoblasts. Yeah, we have discussed already. So tartrate resistant acid phosphatase is characterized for the osteoclast cells. After that, um, they express a special receptor. You also have to remember, these are the RUNC receptor. This is the full name, but it is enough to remember the abbreviation, RUNC receptor. And through this receptor, they get activated. And nowadays in practical medicine, it is very important to manipulate the activity of osteoclast cells. Sometimes we need to inc increase their activity, sometimes to inhibit. Usually we need to inhibit. And to understand how to inhibit them, how to stop bone resorption, yeah. uh, we need to understand how they are regulated. And inhibition of this receptor is a very important um, task for the practical medicine. Then, uh, what about the functions we have already discussed? The resorption of bone, bone remodeling, yeah, along with the bone remodeling process, and regulation of blood calcium. So our bones, they are alive. So old matrix should be resorbed 
to produce new matrix. That's why we need osteoclast cells. Sometimes like uh, different old buildings. Yeah, we need to remove old buildings to build some new one according to the modern technologies. Now, as for the osteoclasts, they are very important, so we discuss them in detail. So, first of all, you have to remember they exhibit three functional zones. The first being the ruffled border. Here it is, ruffled means uh, like folded. Due to those infoldings, uh, osteoclasts, they increase the surface area and exactly ruffled border is in contact with the bone matrix being resorbed. So through the ruffled border, they exercise those many lysosomal enzymes and exactly here they actively work to dissolve from their bone matrix. After that, the clear zone, it seals the space between the osteoclast and underlying bone, preventing the leakage of those enzymes out of the space. So osteoclasts, they work in a very target area, just under them, and they produce uh, enzymes um, under their surface. So clear zone is needed to seal, to, how to say, to attach osteoclasts um, just to the bone surface. Um, here, um, actin filaments uh, are present uh, and uh, they, um, through the integrin receptors, as you remember, integrin, it helps to fix cells to the extracellular matrix components. So here, the cell is attached, is adhered to the bone matrix. And basolateral region, here it is, through the basolateral region, some different wastes are expelled. For example, undigested bone matrix, it is endocytosed from this side, and uh, through transcytosis, it is expelled on the basolateral surface. Um, in this way, osteoclasts work. Now, as for the mechanism on the molecular level, how osteoclasts, they can break down bones if to take into account that bone is very, very stiff and hard. So the first step in the mechanism of their action is to dissolve all the minerals. And they do that with the help of organic and inorganic acids. First, they exhibit a special enzyme, carbonic anhydrase. And this enzyme, it helps to obtain bicarbonate acid, which easily dissociates uh, into the hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. Hydrogen proton is pumped actively with the help of ATP to this space. Besides, this is called Hauschip's lacuna. Lacuna, this is exactly the cave formed by osteoclast along with the process of resorption. So hydrogen ion is pumped here. On the other side, chloride ions are also pumped. And as a result, hydrochloric acid appears. Hydrochloric acid is very strong acid, if you remember from chemistry, and it dissolves almost everything around it. So hydrochloric acid, like in our stomach, it helps in digestion. In um, uh, osteoclast cells, it helps to dissolve hydroxyapatite hydroxy minerals. Um, after that, also some weak organic acids are also produced here. Together, collectively, they dissolve the bone matrix. And after that, matrix metalloproteinases are expelled and exocytosed. Um, lysosomal enzymes start to work as they break down collagen, they break down molecules, they break down fibers. Okay, so let's summarize those um, processes. And first of all, mechanism of action, the first step to produce um, hydrochloric acid um, through the proton pumps and chloride channels. Um, they are pumped to components of the acid is pumped to the Hauschip's lacuna. And after minerals are removed and naked soft collagen fibers are exposed on the surface, then second step, matrix metalloproteinases start to cut them. You remember that examples of matrix metalloproteinases, these are collagenases, elastases, um, and many others, um, including the catepsin K. So two steps. First, we remove inorganic components. After that, we break down organic fibers. And that's how 
osteoclasts work. If they are too active, then osteoporosis might develop. That's uh, when in bones um, um, holes are formed by osteoclasts. Um, and on the other hand, um, osteopetrosis could be developed uh, if osteoclasts are less active than we need them um, because bones become more mineralized, um, more stiff and hard, and it prevents uh, the diffusion of nutrients um, and uh, the, it is also undesirable uh, condition. Then, how to regulate the osteoclast activity? You have to remember two molecules, um, Renkel and osteoprogerin. How they work? On the surface of the osteoclast, there are rank receptors. We have already said at the beginning yeah, that they are stimulated through special receptors. Here they are of green color. And um, when those receptors are activated with a rank ligand, here rank ligand, L means ligand, when rank ligand attaches to the rank receptor, then osteoclast get activated. So rank L molecule stimulates osteoclasts and in this way bone resorption is activated. Interesting that rank L is produced by osteoblast and uh, stromal cells, as well as osteoprogenitor cells, under the action of parathyroid hormone. So when we investigate parathyroid hormone next semester, we'll return to this mechanism. Notice that parathyroid hormone doesn't affect osteoclasts directly, but instead indirectly. First, parathyroid hormone it stimulates osteoblasts to produce rank ligand. Here, osteocytes, osteoblasts, they produce rank ligand, and then rank ligand stimulates osteoclasts. After that, osteoprogerin, another molecule very important, as it is produced by the same cells, osteoblasts, under the action of calcitonin or estrogens. What is the effect? Osteoprogerin, it has an opposite effect. It inhibits, inactivates osteoclasts. How? As you can see, OPG is used as a decoy for rank ligand. Decoy means neutralizing action it has. It uh, contacts with ligand and in this way it prevents those ligand from contact with the receptors on the osteoclasts. In this way, osteoprogerin, it blocks the osteoclast activity. It prevents their activation, in other words. Uh, what is the practical aspect of this uh, mechanism? What is the practical meaning, significance yeah, of this knowledge? Um, uh, because estrogens, they are produced up to the menopausal period, and in the postmenopausal period, there is a decline of estrogens. And this decline results in the increased osteoclast activity. As you can see, estrogens, they stimulate osteoprogerin production and in this way estrogens indirectly inhibit osteoclasts. And when estrogens decline, they do not stimulate osteoprogerin, so osteoclasts are uninhibited, get uninhibited. That's why all women, after the menopausal period, they should be uh, introduced, they should um, regularly uh, be uh, prescribed to the calcium um, drugs yeah, containing calcium because uh, to prevent this effect so, because uh, women after the menopausal period they have high risk of bone fracture due to increased osteoclast activity. Okay, another practical significance is that osteoprogerin and rancol uh, could be measured in the bloodstream and uh, by their ratio uh, one might um, analyze uh, the balance between the resorption and bone synthesis because those processes they should be balanced, of course, um, and it's very important to balance them. So please remember, it's very important. Okay, about the osteoclast uh, regulation of the activity, there are special video files. I'll put the hyperlink in the description. A video are rather helpful. I recommend you to watch them. After that, 
And now, after we have discussed different types of cells, different types of extracellular matrix uh, components, we have to arrange them in a three-dimensional space, and we have to say that there are several types of bone tissues. So now we have to comprehend the classification. So bone tissues, there are only two of them, immature and mature. Also, they have the name primary and secondary, because always at the beginning of bone formation, always primary bone tissue is formed and only a little bit later it is replaced with the secondary. But you have to remember all synonyms as they are widely used and they are equally used in the literature. So immature bone also has the name woven or bundle bone, while mature bone is also called lamellar because it is organized um, in lamella. And mature bone is also classified into spongy and compact Spongy is like a sponge and compact is compact. It's obvious from their names. Uh, in the same bone, we can see usually on the surface compact bone tissue and uh, inside uh, it is made up of spongy bone tissue. They both are lamellar, but they differ in a three-dimensional organization. But uh, on a histological level, they have the same structure. So do not confuse spongy and compact bone they are the same lamellar bone. And when you are asked about the classification, you have to say about the primary and secondary, and only after that about spongy and compact. Let's talk about each tissue in details. First, what about immature bone? It is, um, it has irregular arrangement of collagen fibers. So they are chaotically organized in a three-dimensional space. Um, and also it has relatively low mineral content and relatively high amount of cells. So one might conclude that it is more soft, not so hard and stiff as the secondary bone. Okay, it is less stiff. It is immature. And in adults it is present only in several regions. Um, in adults usually only secondary bone tissue is present, but in our skull in our teeth sockets um, and in some other places, some um, primary bone tissue could be found. Also, after the bone fracture, in case of bone fracture, first primary woven bone is formed, and only after that lamellar bone appears. Um, that's why we investigated structure. But under normal circumstances, in adults, it is almost absent. So now let's um, talk about mature bone, why it is considered as more developed and more uh, effective. So mature or lamellar bone, it is made up of a system of lamella. Lamella is like a plate and extracellular matrix here is organized in plates. There are different types of plates or lamella. We can see here the outer circumferential lamella just under the periosteum. Outer circumferential lamella, they encircle the whole perimeter that's why they are called circumferential, because they encircle the bone, if we are talking about the tubular bones. Then there are inner circumferential lamella. The same, they encircle the bone marrow cavity. After that, there are osteons and concentric lamella inside them. Concentric lamella are cylinder in shape, and they are put inserted one inside another. So concentric lamella are here. And between neighboring osteons, there are interstitial lamella. They just fill spaces between cylinder-like concentric lamella. And now we have to talk about the structure of every lamella, what it is made up of. Here, scan electron micrograph is given. If we uh, investigate the surface of the bone fracture of the compact bone, that's what we can find um, there. We can see that compact bone tissue is made up of many, many layers of so-called bone lamella. Every lamella, here it is in every plate, um, collagen fibers are organized parallel to each other. And of course, collagen fibers are sodden with minerals. That's why each lamella is elastic due to collagen, and at the same time it is stiff enough to endure high mechanical pressure, because it is sodden with minerals. And in neighboring lamella, the direction of collagen fibers 
differ. So if uh, in one lamella it is organized in this way, in the neighboring it could be organized in perpendicular way. Why it is important? Because um, our bones um, should resist um, different mechanical stresses. And if we want to break down bone perpendicular to the arrangement of collagen fibers, it is very difficult to do. But if we try to break it parallel to collagen fibers, it will be very easy to do. Yeah, That's why we have different lamella in the bone and uh, collagen fibers are not organized parallel to the long axis. In every lamella we have different orientation. That's why if we try to break down bone even parallel to its length it will be very difficult to do because in some lamella um, the collagen fibers are oriented perpendicular to this uh, surface. Okay, then let's move on and now we have to say that in the lamellar bone we have so-called morphofunctional unit, which is called osteon. Osteon here it is given. This is the system of concentric lamella. Put one inside another, like a Russian doll system, you know. And uh, as you can see, collagen fibers are oriented in different way. In this lamella, in this way, in the next in the other way. And uh, the cavity inside the osteon, inside the innermost cylinder, is called the Haversian canal. And uh, there is a blood vessel and nerve endings are there. There are blood vessels and nerve endings. Okay, so morphofunctional unit means that this element is regularly repeated in the bone tissue. And understanding the structure of only one osteon, we can understand the structure of the whole tissue. So please remember the definition, this is the elementary question. So what is the osteon? You should answer that this is the morphofunctional unit of the lamellar bone tissue. And it is represented by a system of concentric lamellas uh, with a Haversian canal inside, where we can find blood vessel and nerve endings. Um, okay, usually the Haversian system is oriented parallel to the long axis of the bone, if we are talking about tubular or long bones. And also what you can see here is that between concentric lamellas, osteocytes are compressed. And you can see they are flattened bodies and lots of processes with help of which they contact with each other. That's why those osteocytes being um, close to the source of nutrients, uh, they could share nutrients with others located much far from the source of nutrients. That's why inside our bone system of canaliculi is very well developed. Here is the specimen from the practical lesson and what we can distinguish here, that's what you will be asked uh, along the practical lesson. Here we can see the periosteum made up of connective tissue and uh, Folkman's canal. Folkman's canal or nutritional canal, it is oriented perpendicular to the long axis of the bone and it provides nutrients, um, of course, blood vessels. Then another canal, these are Haversian canals. They are cross-sectioned and Haversian canals are perpendicular to the Folkman's. Then Haversian canals are surrounded by the concentric lamella and here we can see an example of osteon. Here is another osteon, for example, and here's another Haversian canal. Also what we can see here, the outer circumferential lamella, here it is, the outer circumferential. Then these are the concentric lamellas, as we have said, and between them there is the interstitial lamella, for example, here, the very good example of the interstitial lamella. Here is another one. So lamella located, lamella located between the concentric, these are the interstitial. And those small cells, these are the osteocytes. Osteocytes. Okay, here large magnification is given. This is the Haversian canal and these are osteocytes um, compressed between the concentric lamella. This is the Folkman's canal. Okay, let's move on. And at the end of the lecture, this is the last one, information, block of information. These are the steps of bone formation. So we have to understand not only the structure of the tissue, but also how it is formed in embryonic period. There are two ways of bone formation direct and indirect. 
direct when bone is formed um, from nothing. Yeah, so it appears from the mesenchymal tissue. And uh, indirect osteogenesis is when first hyaline cartilage is formed and after that it is replaced with a bone. It is called indirect osteogenesis or endochondral ossification. Let's first investigate direct or intermembraneous ossification model. As a first step in the embryonic period, um, we can see that uh, some mesenchymal stem cells transdifferentiate into osteoblasts. So called osteogenic blastema appears. So at the beginning of the bone formation in the embryo, we can see an islet of osteogenic cells, which is called blastema. Blastema like a bud. Um, those osteogenic cells, osteoblasts, uh, they start to produce um, the osteoid, the matrix, uh, the bone matrix, um, and some of them get embedded in this matrix. Eventually they get surrounded by the very stiff extracellular matrix and being surrounded they transform into the osteocytes. So the first step is the appearance of a group of osteoblast cells. The second step, when those osteoblasts, they start to produce the bone matrix. And uh, some osteoblasts become embedded and transform into osteocytes. Then those left on the surface, they continue to produce more matrix. Um, and in this way, the future bone increases in size. So that's what we call oppositional growth. You remember oppositional growth when tissue is added from the periphery. So osteoblasts, they continue to produce more matrix. Some of them continue to sink in the matrix and transform into osteocytes. Eventually, this primitive bone trabecula, which is now made up of primary bone tissue, should be replaced with a secondary bone tissue. Again, I remind you that in the embryonic period and always when bone tissue is formed, first primary irregular bone tissue is formed and only after that it is replaced with a highly organized lamellar bone tissue. So the last step when primary bone is replaced with the secondary. And uh, let's look in details uh, how it is realized. Um, here we can see that in the woven bone first a group of osteoclast cells they something like they drill a tunnel they drill a tunnel along the future lone axis of the bone. And uh, this tunnel is wide and blood vessels, and this is the future Haversian canal, okay. And the future blood vessels and nerve endings, they start to invade this canal. After that, osteoblasts come and they start to produce concentric lamella in the perimeter of this tunnel, making it more and more narrow. So more and more concentric lamella are added until the tunnel get very narrow and uh, now that's what we call Haversian canal. And in this way primary woven bone with chaotic organization of collagen fibers is transformed into secondary olamellar bone. So first osteoclasts they resorb a tunnel and then this tunnel with the help of osteoblasts is filled with a concentric lamella. That's the consequent, these are the consequent steps um, and stages um, when um, more developed lamellar bone appears from the immature or woven bone. Okay, let's look at the specimen and what we can distinguish there. This is the specimen which is called intermembraneous ossification. And here we can see mesenchymal connective tissue of the embryo. These are the cells um, present at the beginning of embryogenesis. Uh, and exactly from the same cells, osteogenic blastema has appeared. And now bone trabeculi are formed. Uh, this is the primitive bone, which is looks like spongy bone tissue. Bone trabeculi are pink because they're made up of collagen because this osteoid um, has not yet mineralized, made up of only organic components. Um, and um, what cells we can distinguish? Inside the bone trabecula, 
newly formed bone trabecula. These are osteocytes. Here they are embedded inside. While on the surface of the bone there are osteoblast cells. Cells found on the surface, they are much larger, they are more basophilic because they produce lots of proteins yeah, by the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So you see the difference between the size of osteoblast and osteocyte. And the third type of cells could be seen, these are osteoclast cells. They are large, giant and multinucleated with extremely oxyphilic cytoplasm. So it is very easy to distinguish them among others. Uh, and they work on the surface because they are needed to remodel this primary woven bone in the secondary by drilling a tunnel and uh, then osteoblasts um, produce a new kind of matrix. Okay, besides these are the blood vessels um, in the connective tissue. That's what you have to distinguish. Okay, and the last type uh, of uh, the last part of our lecture. Uh, this is the endochondral ossification. So how bones are formed from cartilage. Uh, in humans, um, uh, almost all lone bones, first our skeleton is made up of hyaline cartilages. They are small, but they are stiff enough to endure mechanical pressure. But as they are a vascular, they do not contain blood vessels. So they can't grow and enlarge significantly because diffusion can't nourish uh, the innermost um, cells. That's why if we need to enlarge the skeleton, we need to transform highly a cartilage into bone because bones, they have vessels. That's why we can increase the size of the bone many times while the size of the cartilage is always limited because of the absence of vessels. So the defect of cartilage is not only it is not stiff enough, yet much less stiff than bone, but also because it can enlarge. And uh, first, our bones are made up of hyaline cartilage model. This is the first step. The second step, when around the diaphysis, um, the bone collar is formed. What is the bone collar? Simply perichondrium is transformed into periosteum. Chondroblasts, they transform into osteoblast cells. Okay. So those osteoblast cells, they start to produce dense and stiff extracellular matrix. And in this way, in the core of the hyaline cartilage, exactly in the diaphysis region, hypoxy develops. So here, oxygen concentration decreases because periosteum produces bone matrix and it prevents diffusion of oxygen. When deficiency of oxygen develops, it attracts new blood vessels. So new blood vessels, they get inside the diaphysis and they start to grow and spread inside. Together with blood vessels, along with the tunnels, produced um, drilled by blood vessels. Some osteoprogenitor cells in osteoblast from the periosteum, they start to invade the diaphysis. In this way, bone progenitor cells, osteoprogenitor cells, appear inside the diaphysis. On the other hand, together with the bloodstream, osteoclast cells arrive. So, granulocyte macrophage progenitors, they arrive, fuse one with another with the formation of giant osteoclast cells and together they start to remodel cartilage tissue and to replace it with a bone. So osteoclasts they resorb cartilage while osteoprogenitor cells, osteoblasts, they produce bone matrix instead of cartilage. In this way working together osteoclast resorption of cartilage and osteoblast bone formation Inside the diaphysis, cartilage gets replaced with a bone. You see cartilage is bluish one, bone is yellowish. So cartilage is replaced with a bone. So in the diaphysis, uh, that's what we call the primary ossification center. It develops. After that, and it occurs nearly the 12th week of embryonic development. After the birth, the same process occurs in the epiphysis why it develops a little later because inside epiphysis um, there is no periosteum 
that's why epiphysis they can enlarge more than diaphysis nothing restricts them and diffusion satisfies uh, their demands but when epiphysis become too large to um, supply oxygen in the innermost layer blood vessels start to grow inside again because of the hypoxia because now epiphysis is too large to be nourished by the diffusion oxygen doesn't um, reach the central region so hypoxia stimulates blood vessels to grow inside again in the same way blood vessels they bring progenitors for osteoclast cells and along with the blood vessels osteoblasts arrive so osteoclasts they resorb cartilage osteoblasts they produce bone in this way that's what we call secondary ossification center develops and notice that between them epiphyseal plate is left so between future epiphysis and diaphysis there is an epiphyseal plate which is very very extremely important for children and it is present only in children because these are the source of bone growth in length and the zones of this epiphyseal plate we are going to discuss in detail some because they are the targets for many many hormones first let's summarize the process of endochondral ossification nothing difficult first hyaline model of the bone is formed then periosteum appears then the hypoxia inside the diaphysis stimulates in growth of blood vessels <coughs> i'm sorry and together with blood vessels some osteoclasts and osteoblasts arrive so now bone replaces the cartilage later on in the epiphysis the secondary ossification center is formed in the same way and between them the epiphyseal plate is left and here epiphyseal plate is given in the enlarged um, magnification and let's investigate its zones um, first in the epiphyseal plate there is a resting zone here it is resting zone it means that this is the typical hyaline cartilage after that the second zone is the zone of proliferation here intense mitotic activity could be seen and cells are arranged in a stack of coins um, they are small and they actively divide and this is the sign of the active growth of course in the next zone cells they start to grow I remind you that these are the chondrocytes yeah so cells of cartilage um, they enlarge that's why we call them hypertrophy the zone of hypertrophy next the undergo calcification process some um, so calcium salts are formed here and then the ossification zone could be seen that's here exactly here when cartilage get replaced with a bone so cartilage is resorbed by osteoclasts and bone is produced by osteoblasts so what is important to understand that bones they can't elongate bone tissue can't grow in length only in thickness due to periosteum but in length bones could grow only due to proliferation of cartilage so exactly cartilage growth is the basis for elongation of the skeleton and uh, this process is often impaired uh, and it is important to understand what hormones do regulate this process and these are the most important last lecture we have already discussed in terms of cartilage growth but now i want to remind you to understand that cartilage growth is important not only to grow of the cartilage but for the whole skeleton so do not forget that somatotropin it stimulates exactly proliferation zone it stimulates proliferation and that's why if it is too active if it is producing high amount then children get very long and bones are you know, tubular bones are extremely long in this case some um, like spider fingers so sometimes we compare yeah then tyroxine and testosterone they stimulate production of the extracellular matrix so also growth of the cartilage but uh, the interstitial growth the growth from inside um, that's why in um, boys um, they start to grow the skeleton undergoes massive remodeling with them um, puberty and the opposite process we can see in uh, girls uh, because in girls uh, instead uh, estrogens they inhibit the growth of the cartilage so usually 
girls they st stop to grow with a sexual maturation and uh, preliminary sexual maturation um, inhibits the growth uh, and it affects um, the length uh, of the skeleton so that's what we have to take into account of course there are many more factors including um, uh, molecular factors um, uh, should be taken into account. Also, epiphyseal plate, this is the typical place of the bone fracture and uh, in children in this uh, place uh, usually bones um, they are broken. That's what we have to take into account. And uh, this is an example of the USMLE test uh, and I offer you to answer yourself. Um, your answers please put in the description in the comments below. <coughs> I think that uh, it is not very difficult. Uh, uh, here the condition is all about the two month old boy and among other problems it has uh, short extremities especially in proximal segments uh, short stature for his age group um, and the question is which of the following process is most likely defective in this case and you should choose some um, one of those options. Uh, please uh, uh, put in the comments what do you think about this and what process is really affected in this um, uh, case. Um, and uh, the most last uh, what we have to do is to analyze the specimen. This is exactly the endochondral ossification. We can see epiphysis made up of hyaline cartilage. We can see diaphysis made up of woven bone, primary bone tissue. We can see oxophilic bone trabecular because they made up of calcium, I'm sorry, collagen. Calcium salts are not yet deposited, that's why they are pink in color. And after that, um, on the surface of trabecula, uh, trabecula we can see osteoblasts uh, inside trabecula osteoclast cells, and those um, zones of epiphyseal plate are not yet formed because there is no epiphyseal plate. There is uh, hyaline cartilage in the epiphysis. Yeah, and uh, here is the periosteum. That's what we can see. In the larger magnification we can find some osteoclasts um, there, but under this magnification we can't. So the primary ossification center has already formed, while secondary has not yet appeared. Then, uh, as for the bone remodeling, uh, after we have discussed uh, the process of bone formation, primary, direct ossification or indirect ossification, we have to say that after the bone fracture, after the bone fracture, uh, first also primary bone tissue is uh, formed, but before this primary bone tissue is formed, um, there is a connective tissue scar made up of uh, fibrous um, fiber cartilage. So after the bone remote, after the bone fracture, after the hematoma, blood clot is formed. Uh, first, the soft callus is formed, made up of fiber cartilage. And after that, it is replaced with a primary bone. And after that, with a secondary bone tissue. And uh, this process takes up to 12 weeks, uh, depending on the circumstances, on the age uh, and the type of fracture. While the uh, replacement of primary with a secondary bone tissue takes several years. Here, this process is... Um, organized in text uh, for you to analyze. It is important because bone fractures is frequently occur in pathology and that's what we have to understand uh, that first hematoma is formed, after that granulation tissue <coughs> forms fiber cartilage of the soft callus on the second or third week. After that third, fourth month it includes the replacement of the fiber cartilage with the primary bone tissue and notice that several years are needed to replace primary bone tissue with the secondary. And uh, there is a very helpful video, I put the hyperlink in the description below. And I want to say thank you for watching till then, because this is one of the most difficult lectures. Uh, and uh, please work hard, because the topic is really important, very, very important for you. Okay, thank you. Subscribe if you do really like our video files, and it will be very pleasant for us. Okay, we'll see you next time. Goodbye.